Uh, I met Dan in 2004, right? Uh, on a workshop in Italy in the mountains. And, and I remember well when he started to talk about, so it was like 20 people, he started to talk about behavior driven development. Because one of the group challenged, what, 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 is, this, what is this about? What, explain it to me. And he basically explained it in front of the group. This was four years before we started to deal with that. So I just realized now how many years ahead you were then already. I wonder where you are now ahead. So that's why, how far? Um, that's why I'm so happy that he accepted our invitation to come. He asked me what he should talk about. I said, like, you pick something. I don't know. You're ahead of me, so you have to pick it. <laughs> and this is how the title came out, which uh, I already mentioned that probably you will have an explanation for this as well. So, without further ado, let me introduce Dan Norris for the second keynote. So this funny thing happened on the way to the air. Um, so the title, the talk is billed as a scaling talk. It is a scaling talk. Um, what it isn't is a scaling agile talk. Because otherwise that would be flying in the face of the talk I gave about a year ago called Why Agile Doesn't Scale. <laughs> agile Doesn't Scale. There you go. I said it. Okay. Um, what does that mean? That means that... Um, what we have, Agile as a movement, uh, and Joseph articulated it beautifully this morning. So, Agile as a movement started with uh, 17 middle aged white men in a snow cabin. Um, what he might not know is that was their second attempt. So, the first attempt was the previous year. They all got together and they all got drunk and they said, That was awesome. We should do this again and get some output. So, they did it again the next year and they got the Agile Manifesto. Um, I'm a bit more optimistic about the Agile Manifesto. I think it does have legs. I think what happened, unfortunately, is that uh, everyone, including all the people in the room, everyone immediately threw it out the window. And it's exactly that movement to uh, commercial uh, industry to racket type narrative arc. So you know, people started selling stuff. And as soon as there's certification, you get kind of the pyramid selling scheme where you get to annoy people, right? That's, that's typically where the wheels fall off. So, about a year ago, in fact, almost exactly a year ago, I met up with Chris Matz, who I've heard name-checked here a number of times already today. So Chris is the other half of BDD. And in fact, Chris is the given of given when then. Right? So, and there's a guy called Ivan Moore. Who, who's heard of Ivan Moore? Do any of you guys know Ivan Moore? Okay, so a couple of hands. Uh, was the when then. Okay, so the story is, um, I was looking at this at a code level, and then we kind of panned back and looked at the... At a, at a kind of application level. And Ivan Moore had this fantastic thing he would do. So you have these index cards, and you write the story on the index card, and on the back of the index card, he put a line down it, and he wrote two columns. I do this, this happens. Okay? So I do this, you know, I enter my credit card details, this happens, I pay for my goods. And he'd have a few of these, and they were basically acceptance tests. Right? That, was, that was how you knew the story was done. And I showed Chris this, and I said, this is awesome, we should do this. And he said, it's missing something. So what do you mean? He said, well, I do this. He said, anything could happen. Said, no, that happens. He goes, no, anything could happen. You're missing context. Said, oh, you know. Oh, oh. So somebody realised this thing. And, and so, so we had, you know, when I do this, this happens. And it was, oh, wait, we're missing a column. And so we shoved it all across a little bit, put given in there, and that was where that... And it used to be just a single line. Given this, I do this. When I do this, then this happens. And that was the whole of that was the whole of uh, acceptance criteria. So anyway, Chris and I stayed friends. This was over, over a decade ago. Chris and I stayed friends. We still see each other. We hadn't really worked together. And we met up last year, this time last year. And he's been at a large, uh, well-known um, online video calling company that got bought by a very large, well-known <laughs> brand-based uh, software company. And I was working at a very large American bank. And we discovered we ended up building exactly the same model for scaling delivery. And scaling, I'm talking about getting 80, 100 people all pointing in the same direction. And we also realized that we'd done it um, slightly differently from the way the other kids were doing it. 
And so we've spent most of this year giving it a name and so and structuring it. So this talk is where we've got to. So this is a this is a work in progress, if you like. So the project business mapping. So let's start. So the context then. So the context is you're in an organisation, there's some lean or agile transformation underway. Okay, who's, who's got one of those? Who's got some kind of lean agile transformation underway? Quite, quite a few hands. Quite a quarter of you. Okay. And we have several successful deliveries, you know, project scale deliveries, and for values of several and successful, right? Variably several and variably successful, but we've declared victory a few times. We're feeling pretty confident. And so Agile is now normal. What Agile is now normal, what that means is I've trained all of my project managers and they're now called Scrum Masters, and I've trained all of my business analysts and they're now called Product Owners, so we're Agile. Right? It turns out that the psychometrics of being a good Scrum Master, which is essentially a coaching servant leader role, are diametrically opposed to the psychometrics of being a good old style project manager which means you took exactly the wrong people and put them in charge. Go us. We've ruled at this. Okay. So, Agile's now normal. So now the challenge. The challenge is this. The challenge is two sides. And this is why Chris and I have been getting so excited, because Chris is all about the business, all about the money. Right? I care about things like people, and, and how work gets done, kind of the process around the work and the system of work. So I'm a systems thinking, you know, complexity theory kind of person. I love all that. And I also love that the systems thinking guys and the complexity theory guys hate each other and they're basically saying the same things. It's sibling rivalry, right? It's like, it's like England and France, yeah? It's like you guys are hungry. It's like you've been friends for years, yeah? Don't talk about it. So, uh, um, so Chris is all about the money. You know, show me the money, show me the business. And I'm all about the people. Chris doesn't give a crap about people. Or we, we thought me. Okay. Chris loves people. <laughs> really important. But so we figure that we now have kind of the yin and yang of how this works. So this is... Um, so the challenge on Chris's side then, on the business side, is this. I want to scale the work. So what does scaling mean? That means planning in the large. What does it mean to plan a uh, 150 million euro program? What does it mean to have 100 people uh, try to solve the same thing? And some problems are wide. Some problems, yeah, I could take a small team and they could iterate and they could emerge and all that kind of good stuff if I've got 10 years. If I want to solve tax, I want to rewrite tax. That is a 500 person problem. Okay? Solving tax is a 500 person problem. I can slice it into pieces, but it's still a very wide problem. So this is the, that, that kind of scale we're looking at. Or in a bank, risk. I want to do risk, or I want to do operations. Operations is a, the bank I was working at, they have a trillion dollars a day operation. Right? I don't know how many seconds of downtime at eBay meant dollars, but if you're a trillion dollars a day, 24 hour operation, you do the maths, how many microseconds do you need to be offline before it starts getting A, expensive, B, fines, C, criminal liability. Criminal liability. Yeah? You need to keep the lights on. It'll be ready when it's ready isn't good enough. Okay. So, planning the large, defining a program, what does it mean to put a program and work together? And, and managing a portfolio. So this is now I'm looking at risk across a number of work streams. Okay. So this is the business side. On the human being side, this idea of growing people. So I hear this a lot in organisations. People are lost in Agile. I used to be Dev 1, Dev 2, Dev 3, Senior Dev, Architect, Manager. That's my career. Okay? And then I become a CXO and then I just start on the merry-go-round and I go from business to business being a, a CXO. I wait till I break everything then I leave. <laughs> um, so, but people are lost. I flatten the organisation now. I turn up, I'm Dan, a year later I'm Dan, two years later I'm Dan. I know I've learned loads of stuff. I know I'm more valuable to you, I can't prove it. Right? And so people say things like, what does good look like? What does good look like for an agile business analyst? I know what good looks like for a traditional business analyst. You measure it in kilos of paper. Okay? So I can do that. In terms of project managers, it's the number of souls I destroy delivering <laughs> this work. Right? There's metrics. Okay? So, but how do I grow? Yeah, and, and how do I get promoted? The bottom line, how do I get promoted? So this is the challenge. How, what do we do here? So then on the inputs, on the business side, the inputs look like this. We've got organizational inputs. We've got KPIs. So this is the top level thing. So at, uh, for instance, at Skype, 
Stripe at an enterprise level has KPIs around their funnel. So you have non-registered users, casual users, then you're registered, then you're a subscriber, and then you're a premium subscriber. You're buying all these premium services. And for each of those steps in the pipeline, you've got a plus number and a minus number. So plus is new subscribers, minus is churn. People who you know, uh, unsubscribe. And so this is your organizational level KPIs on the, on the business side. On the operation side, it might be things like um, customer visible outages, okay, some sort of quality metric, some kind of OPEX metric. <clears throat> so we've got these kind of KPIs. And near and midterm goals. Where do we want to be in six months? Where do we want to be in a year's time? Um, and then you have, you look at this as a constraints problem. So you have external constraints, so things like the regulatory environment. I'm not allowed to trade unless I can prove this level of compliance. So one that happened a few years ago, I need to, if I'm a bank, I need to be able to determine which is my money and which is my client's money. Because I'm only allowed to mess around with my money. It kind of stands to reason, yeah? It turns out that when you've got a bank that is literally 300 other banks banged together, right, which a lot of them are now, um, particularly a large Swiss bank I was talking to recently, Okay, then to discovering whose money is which is actually a non-trivial problem. It's hard. And so it's about best endeavours. Right? No one wants to shut anyone down. They just want you to be making sense. They want you to be trading safely. And then you might have structural constraints. I might have uh, a bunch of guys in Bratislava, a bunch of guys in Budapest, I might have a bunch of guys in Bangalore. I only ever have people in towns beginning with B. Okay? But they're all over the world. And so there's things like um, uh, organizational constraints. And this is, this is what Chris observed. When you look at things like Less and Safe and Dad and all of these scaling, air quote, scaling models, they are predicated on figuring out what's the optimum uh, return for some spend. And that suggests that money is the constraint. I'm going to make you guys a bet. Okay? I'm going to give you infinity money. You have infinity money, you all have a blank checkbook. Can you go faster? <coughs> Who would be able to go faster if they had infinity money? Right? That's not the constraint. Right? If I said to you, here's 100 million euros, I'm like, I've got a team of 30 people, I can't burn 100 million euros. Here's most of it back. Right? I'm not set up to consume that kind of money. Yeah? So, Money isn't a constraint. Funding isn't a constraint. The process, the organisation, the way we do work is usually the constraint. And so what we wanted to do was look at it through a different lens. So on the organisation lens, so we've got these inputs. On the people side, we've got two sets of inputs. There's what you can do and what you want to be able to do. And I said to Chris, well actually before this, it was about three years ago, I was working with this, this large American bank figuring out how to do program deliver at scale. And I said, one, I want career aspirations to be a first class input. Okay? So in other words, I would say, so Joseph, what can you do? Well, a list of things Joseph can do. What do you want to do? What do you want to do in six months' time? Because if I can make that a first class input into how I structure work, I'm more likely to get you excited. I'm more likely to grow you in a direction you want to grow in. And I'm more likely to retain you. Okay? So, uh, there's a wonderful uh, um, software firm I've been working with in, in Poland. And they have, they're, they're recruiting art. They have these they have four areas they talk about. Attract, recruit, grow, retain. And I thought that's a beautiful way of describing HR. Right? Attract. Are we the kind of company you want to go work in? Recruit. Can we hire the people we want to hire? Grow. Once we've got you, can we give you a career worth having? Retain. Once you're getting better at this stuff, how do we carry on being the place you want to work? I just thought that was beautiful. So, so it's that kind of stuff. So there's the inputs. <clears throat> Here's the assumptions. Okay? And this was the stuff that Chris and I started challenging. The assumptions are I have a bunch of scrum teams. Okay? Here's my all feature teams. 8, eight to 10, 8, eight plus or minus 2. Yeah? And I've got three dev pairs, a tester, an analyst, and whatever else. And that's the shape of all my teams. And I might have tens of these, I might have hundreds of these. And so now I have two problems. I've got this big gob of work, this big pile of work. Okay? And what I want to do is I have two problems. I have a scatter problem and I have a gather problem. So how do I 
slice up this big pile of work so that a whole bunch of teams can consume it? How do I bring it back together afterwards and turn it into product? Okay. And, and that is what all of these scaling models are trying to solve, this problem. They're saying we've got uh, so many teams and they're doing you know, Scrum or Kanban or whatever this week's method of the day is. And, uh, oh, pop quiz by the way, who's doing Kanban? Yeah, hands up, be proud, be proud. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up if you are limiting working process, measuring cumulative flow, if you can tell the SLAs around uh, different classes of service throughout your system. Yeah, you're not doing Kanban, you just threw out the rules of Scrum because it's crappy. <laughs> yeah. Throwing out Scrum and calling it Kanban isn't Kanban. Okay. The two people whose hands are still up, well done you. Have a gold star. But everyone else, it's not Kanban. It's called unmanaged software delivery. It's called random, made up stuff. XEM. Certified random stuff maker upper. That's, that's a thing we should do. Let's get the printing presses going. So, where do Scrum teams come from, feature teams? What's, does anyone know what the rationale is behind having cross-functional teams? <coughs> the question you can answer. Anyone know where the idea of cross-functional teams came from? Come on! Who in this room is in a cross-functional team? Like a team of mixed people, or like you know, testers, developers, all those kind of people, all in a team doing work. Right? Yeah. Loads of you. And you don't know why. That's not really good, is it? Go find out why. So why is, uh, it comes back to a thing called Lean Operations, which underpins all this stuff. Lean Operations has a principle at the heart of it, which is that you move the people to the work. Traditional operations moves the work to the people. That's where conveyor belts came from. So conveyor belts is a way of scaling. Moving the people to the work is a way of effective results, which is why when, you, when a car pulls into the pit in a, in a race, it pulls in and all these people swarm around it. And I'm, um, uh, I'm uh, front right wheel nut number three, okay? And Jeff is front right wheel nut number four. And we drill this, we practice it like that. Every day, for hours a day. So when that car comes in, we can both go in there, always roll number one, don't bump into each other, right? So we get in there, we don't bump into each other, and seconds later, the car shoots off out of the pit with four new tires on it. Wow, right? That's what happens when you move the people to the work. So the early Scrum guys and the early Agile guys, they said, well, if we move the people to the work in knowledge work, that means cross-functional teams. Makes sense. What about at scale? At scale, I have 100 people, and I have a big bag of work. What I'm doing with this model is I'm moving the work to the people. I've presupposed that I've got these little Scrum teams, now I need to slice up the work and move it to the people. I've recreated the problem I thought I was solving. And this is the idea, so solutions at scale are substantively different from solutions in the small. We need to reimagine things. So, what happens if we reimagine things then? Well, we move beyond feature teams. <clears throat> That's the first thing we care about. I want to get beyond feature teams uh, towards product teams. So my 80 people, my little 80 person army, that's my team. I'm a member of the risk platform team. Okay, there's 80 of us. We build the risk platform. Yeah, sure, there's little squads of us that go off and do work, but those are short-lived, those are fairly dynamic. Okay, the team, my sense of belonging, is in this larger team. We celebrate as a team. We get together as a team, an kind of town halls idea. We know what's going on as a team. We have a product vision as a team. You know, 18 months, two years down the line, we will have the best uh, risk platform in banking in Austria. That's what we're going to do. That's our vision. Okay? We want to be able to sell our risk platform as a service to other banks. That'd be pretty cool. You know? Pop quiz. If you, whatever you're currently working on, if you spun that off as its own business, would you hire you? Would you hire you to deliver the thing you're currently delivering? If not, what, 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 what is it about that product that needs to be different? So we want to get beyond feature teams, we want to move the people to the work, and we want to optimise for a thing called risk-adjusted return on capital. So we all know ROI, right? Return on investment, return on capital. Return on capital is, I spend some money, my capital, I expect to get a return. But return on capital is a very <coughs> blunt instrument. 
it's very, it's not a particularly good way of measuring things. Because, and this goes back to option theory again, it doesn't matter how much I make, it matters when I make it. So if I need to invest uh, 10 million euros in a piece of work, and I invest it a uh, million euros a month, this happens I'm burning, okay? And then 10 months later, I ship this thing, and people start using it, that's great, I start making money. There's a metric there called value at risk. Value at risk is this, 10 months in, I've, I've, I've now burned 10 million euros, I've got nothing back from it, what if I'm wrong? That's a really expensive rock. Yeah. What if instead, after each month, I had something shipping that was then making me a little bit of money? Then what I'm doing is I'm paying down the risk, I've got less value at risk. I've invested a million to get something, and I've invested the next million, but now the first million is already making some money. And so it starts to offset, and the further into the 10 months I get, the more stuff I've got in the wild, that paying down my risk. So risk-adjusted return on capital is what am I going to make and when am I going to make it? And so this starts again to be something that we care about. So, before I go into how we do this, there's something I want to point out. There's this idea of what I call a cycle of effective change. If you want to make change and you want that change to last, oh, quick check. I know for almost everyone in this room, English is not your first language, okay? Um, if I'm speaking too quickly, or if I'm mumbling, swallowing my words, uh, I apologise. I have 45 minutes to try and cover at least an hour and a half worth of material, so I won't be slowing down. I just thought I'd let you know I know. <laughs> so, psycho-effective change in. I see any, any effective change <clears throat> has three distinct elements to it. So the first thing we have is visualise. Turning the lights on. Okay? Understanding what it is about your world. Let's measure stuff. Baselining. Okay? Then we stabilise. So stabilise means this. It doesn't matter if you are eye-wateringly bad, if you are unbelievably bad at something, as long as you're consistently amazingly bad at that thing. <laughs> because now I can work with that. Yeah. So an example, uh, one of my clients, they went from three monthly releases to monthly releases. And now they did monthly releases. And they said, we're really pleased because we've stabilised at monthly releases. But I said, uh, okay, I don't care. Like, oh, what do you mean you don't care? You know, you're coming in and measuring stuff. We've got a thing for you to measure and it's stable. I said, what's the average age of a thing in that release? So all the features that are getting dropped this month, when did they start? It's like the concept of caching. What's the lead time, is the technical term. What's the lead time for a feature in that release? And it turned out that the average lead time for a feature in the release was eight months. And it was eight months, plus or minus, six months. <laughs> so, on average, it was random. And on average, it was random from something we thought of eight weeks ago to it's been cooking for two years and we're still nowhere close. Right? That's what I mean by visualise. Stabilise is, even if we stabilise it a year, if it's a year plus or minus a month or two, now we've got something we can work on. Okay? So we look at lead time, that's the lens we look through, and we stabilise to bad, but consistently bad. Now, we can optimise. Who in this room is involved in software? Everyone. Right? We love this one. We love optimise, that's what we do. And so we all jump into optimise. And we just start twiddling with the dials. We've got no idea what the dials do, because we didn't visualise, we didn't stabilise, but it's still fun. Okay? <laughs> and we have value stream maps, and we have Gantt charts, and we have burn up and burn down of velocity, and we have predictions, and we have cones of uncertainty, and we have all kinds of rubbish. Who uses Fibonacci planning poker? Yeah. Get out of here! <laughs> it's not a thing. It doesn't work. You're using detail solutions to dynamic problems. You're trying to chop down a very big thing, a big thing that isn't terribly complicated. There aren't many moving parts, but it is adaptive. It changes as you do stuff with it. It's called a complex adaptive system. The way you engage with a complex adaptive system is different from the way you engage with a detail system. A detail system is, I need to build a hospital. It'll take me 18 months, it'll cost me 150 million euros, and I can tell you every single step of the way there, Okay? A dynamic problem is weather. So weather has four things. It has 
Wind, water, temperature and pressure. That's all of weather. Okay, a bit of geography, but that's all of weather. You cannot predict weather because weather affects weather. What happens in weather changes weather. So even though it's a much smaller uh, thing to describe than everything involved in building a hospital, it is unknowable in its nature. You cannot know what weather will be like. Software development is like weather more than it's like hospitals. But all of our processes are about hospitals because we stole it all from civil engineering in the 70s. That's why we call it software engineering. We wanted it to be respectable. Yeah. It's a lot more like surgery, but that's a talk for another day. And so because I see loops everywhere because everything's a system, we then go back round. As we optimise, we then want to look through a different lens. So visualise is you're turning on the lights and you're in a room full of tigers. And I'm going to turn on the lights. You were already in a room full of tigers. Okay, that's not my fault. Yeah? They're your tigers. Okay? As someone said to me, they said, yes, but now the tigers can see you. <laughs> so maybe you're in a room full of bear traps, I don't know. But anyway, you're in a room full of, you're in the dark, and I turn the lights on, and now you're going to blame me. Okay? That's okay. So everything about business mapping is this one. All I care about is visualise. Because it turns out, as you go around this, you get more and more specific. So visualize is very general. You can apply these visualize techniques anywhere. So business mapping started in software delivery. You can apply it to product development. You can apply it to retail. You can apply it to business operations. You can apply it to HR. It doesn't matter. Yeah? The way you stabilize that process becomes more context specific. And the way you optimize is even more specific. So this is just at the visualize level. I'm just helping you turn the lights on. So we have this thing then called business mapping. <clears throat> and it's made up of a number of pieces. I'm going to try and describe the pieces. Initiative mapping. So my organizational KPIs, that funnel I talked about, how do I figure out those in, which initiatives across the organization are going to move those dials? So I might have a marketing initiative, I might have an engineering initiative, I might have a, a business operations initiative. Yeah. So how do I choose those things? Having decided what initiatives I want to embark on. Those initiatives are made up of programs and I want to start figuring out what the business demand is for those programs. So that's called demand mapping. So we now have a supply and demand problem in terms of program delivery. On the business demand side, I want to understand the supply side. This is Katie. We'll meet Katie again in a minute. Katie's a, Katie's a program. Katie's awesome. Yeah. Um, what I want to understand about Katie is what she knows and what she wants to know. We call that skills mapping. And then what we do is we take the skills mapping stuff, like the supply side, the stuff I know about people, and we take the demand mapping stuff, what I want to deliver, and we put it all in the bag and we shake it up. And then we call that um, delivery mapping. So delivery mapping then is, is how do we figure out the optimal shape. And at no point in business mapping you'll notice I did I say the word agile, or did I talk about teams. Okay? Feature teams isn't a thing. We need to get past feature teams. Let's take a very, very quick wander through these things. Then. So initiative mapping. Initiative mapping, I've got an organisational KPI. Uh, reduce the churn of my premium subscribers. <coughs> Increase my market presence in Estonia. Okay? Uh, start trading euro bonds in, uh, on the west coast. Okay? It's a business level, high level, Lever. And so I think in terms of, now I need to figure out some initiatives in here, right? What metrics, what metrics, if I saw those metrics trending, are likely to move that dial? So now this is a hypothesis. How many people in the room studied science in some form or another? Okay. What is a hypothesis? What's the definition of a hypothesis? Anyone? I keep asking this and people keep not telling me. What's a hypothesis? Something falsifiable. Oh, thank you. It's a falsifiable statement. Otherwise, it's just a statement slash opinion. Okay? So, the thing that makes something a hypothesis isn't that I can prove it, it's that I can disprove it. So, I come up with a hypothesis that these metrics up here will move that dial. Okay? Now, I want to identify some initiatives then that are going to... Um, move that file. So, I, so I'm making another hypothesis. This initiative here has these metrics. If these metrics trend in the way I expect, it'll move these. And if these move in the way I expect, my dial moves. 
Okay? A series of falsifiable statements. If I can disprove any one of those, I should just kill that initiative. It wasn't the right thing to do. And within those, I then have programs. So, here's an example. I'm making movies. Okay? I'm making Avengers Assemble, uh, uh, Avengers Age of Ultron, Captain America, Iron Man 4. All of these have maybe some kind of chase sequence or dramatic sequence uh, in, set in New York. Okay? So, in order to film these, I need to go to New York and I need to set up filming. And it turns out a lot of filming happens in New York and they're quite well set up for it. So then there's a number of facilities I'm going to need to engage. I'm going to need to talk to the police, I'm going to need to talk to the ambulance, air and fire department. Okay? And get those guys to help me make my movies. And so what I do is I come up with some kind of measure of maybe how many people or how much effort, something, how much engagement do I need from each of those people to, um, to, to make my movies. And we do a bit of a uh, you know, back, back, back of a card calculation, and we come up with some numbers. So we say, Avengers Assemble, um, it's going to be quite a, quite a large police presence. Um, there's, you need an ambulance, because you always need an ambulance. <laughs> um, and we don't really, there's, no, there's no air stuff, and we don't really need the fire department. Okay? So then, um, I look at Iron Man 4. Well, Iron Man 4's got uh, Robert Downey Jr. in it. Okay? So I need a load of police. <laughs> there's going to be women swarming the set, so I need a huge police presence. Um, again, and a bunch of ambulances because Robert Downey Jr. breaks stuff, um, and so on. And so you can see, um, this, it, these are some things that I need to consider making my movies. Okay? The things across the top, you can look at these as constraints. So each of these is a reason why I can or can't do something. So if I looked at, say, Iron Man 4, right, that's the one I want to make next, but that's a surefire banker. All the others are a little bit, I'm not sure, but Iron Man 4, billion dollars right there. Yeah? Except I can't just go in and start filming that. I need a significant investment of effort by the police. So what I'd probably do is I'd probably start with Captain America. And I start with Captain America, which needs a much smaller police presence, and I start building relationships. So I start enabling that capability. I start flexing that constraint and understanding how that works. Then I say, hey, look, you know how, that, how well that movie went? They said, yeah, that was really good fun. Great, I'm going to need a whole bunch more of you to do this uh, Iron Man 4. Like, yeah, yeah, we're up for that. What I wouldn't do probably is do the Avengers Age of Ultron, the second one, first. Because even if that succeeds, I've had no engagement with the police. So I don't have a relationship with them. Yeah. And you can use this same metaphor into the organisation. So you're trying to build, you're trying to assemble, uh, mobilise a programme of work. What are the parts of the organisation with whom you need a relationship? Who are the constraints there? Who do you need to build relationships with? And what would be useful work to start that moving? So, so these are constraints. Each of these numbers then represents a conversation. I need to go and talk to some people to get some help. So again, the fire department for Avengers Age of Ultron. Um, I might try making that movie first, but now I've got no relationship with the fire department and I'm going to need like two thirds of their downtown trucks. That's a big investment by them, and that's a big risk for them, and it's a big risk for all of the people who live in downtown New York who now don't have any fire department. So if there's, say, a fire, right, that could be bad. And so it's, this starts to help me with sequencing. So now I've decided I'm going to make one of these movies, and that's now a series of programs of work. So now let's move into a program of work, into a thing we call demand mapping. So demand mapping. I'm going to start off by mapping out the first few quarters. This is now Q plus one, Q plus two. So this is about a year's worth of planning I'm going to do. And it's at a fairly high level. And the first thing I do is I say, what business capabilities do I want to have over those quarters? Okay. And these are specifically business capabilities, not technical deliveries. And I mark them on there, and I use diamonds. And the reason I use diamonds is the people I want to engage at this point are program managers, and they use diamonds. <laughs> When you're talking to farmers, use farmers' words. One of my Swedish friends taught me. Yeah? If that's the language they expect to see, show them that. These are milestones, these are deliverables, these are gates, these are whatever you want to call it. And people feel safe when they see familiar things. We're about to part ways with Gantt charts, but for now, it looks a bit like it. So the first thing we ask them, once we've got these things up here, is you want this stuff, you want each of these, yeah? How much? How much do you want them? So we turn the estimation conversation on its head. Rather than saying, let's estimate this piece of work, we say, well, how much do you want to invest in this? And we use a very specific unit. 
and the specific unit we have um, is about a team for about a week. Now it turns out about a team is say maybe 10 people. Okay? The, the fully loaded cost of a person is about $1,000 a day, roughly. Okay? Again, all of this is roughly. And so that means the fully loaded cost of a 10 person team is $10,000 a day. So a week of that team is $50,000. Okay? So you end up with this idea of roughly units of $50,000 or 30,000 pounds, or 200,000 euros, right? <laughs> whatever it's doing at the moment. <laughs> um, and so uh, we call this unit of about a team week a swag, which is sweet wild ass guess. Okay? And the point of it is that it is a bit of a guess. I want to know roughly, is it bigger than a bread box and smaller than a house? I just want size here. Rough size. We're not going to figure out how to solve it, we're going to figure out how much we want to invest. And immediately we're having some conversations. So the conversations are, there is no way on God's good earth you'll get that inside 10 swags. It's at least a 15, 20 swag problem. Great, well I know that before I spend any money at all. Or, you know, if it takes me more than 15 swags to deliver this thing, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah? That gives me a range in terms of investment. I know roughly what I'm dealing with. Here's now where we part ways. Because in a traditional plan-driven process, I would now start breaking these boxes, these pieces, into um, the tasks. I'd start, I would assume it's a reducible problem and I start reducing it. I start breaking it into pieces and then I estimate the pieces and I roll them up. Mostly this isn't a reducible problem. This is an emergent problem. Okay, this is uh, uh, dynamic complexity, not detailed complexity. Or in Canadian terms, this is complex rather than complicated. Complicated is lots of little bits. Complex is weird emergent behaviour. Most software development is discovery. Okay. So I ask a different question. I say which parts of my estate are going to be touched when I do this work? Which apps, systems, platforms, parts of the business, all of that kind of stuff. That's what I care about. In order to deliver this compliance piece, I'm going to need to touch this system, that platform, need to interface with this team over here, and compliance and the security guys over there. I can see roughly how I might engage this work. Again, I don't know the detail yet, but I know I'm looking at the constraints. And so, based on those constraints, I then say, well, <clears throat> which skills and capabilities does that suggest I'm going to need to deliver those constraints, and therefore to deliver those pieces of work? And those skills and capabilities might be technical. I need some COBOL mainframe people. I need some SQL Server 2003, because, <laughs> not kidding, true story. Um, or it may be I need someone who can navigate the organisation. I need someone with a good relationship with that vendor, because that's going to be really important. And so it could be social interaction skills, it could be network. It could be I want to get Joseph on the team because he knows some people who are going to be really useful. Yeah. And he's a great guy, I want him on my team. But like, particularly, without that skill covered off, we're going to have a problem. Right? So, so this now is the demand side. I understand uh, what my diamonds are, what my, what my business deliverables, my business goals are. I map that to the parts of my world that will be touched, and based on those parts of the world, I understand what skills and capabilities I need. Right, let's pan back. Let's look at the skills side now. Remember Katie? I said we'll meet Katie again. This is Katie. This is how Katie describes herself. She says, I'm a developer. I'm a developer in a team, working on a product, working on a platform, in a department, in an organisation. Okay? So immediately, Katie is now this multi-dimensional person. There's six different dimensions here. And I can ask Katie about all of those dimensions, and I can say, what do you think makes you effective in a team? Well, obviously there's the interpersonal skills and being able to play nice, but there's also things like, if I'm a developer, we've got a DBA, but I can also do some DBA stuff. So this is where we get to T-shaped people. So a developer who knows some testing, who knows some analysis, who knows some sysadmin, is really useful because if I lose my tester for a few days, we're not stuck. Yeah. So, so some of these kind of T-shaped things are really useful. So, so what about the um, what about your departmental skills? This is how well you navigate the organisation. Like what relationships do you have? There's a difference between impact and influence. Impact is what you do. Influence is what you cause other people to do. And I kind of want a combination of both. So we can look at Katie and we can say there's all of these different skills and capabilities across each of these six dimensions. And now suddenly I'm starting to get a much more nuanced idea of who Katie is. And so, 
For each of these skills, I ask Katie to score herself. Okay? And it's a very, very simple scoring model. I used to use the Dreyfus model for this, but it's kind of a bit too complicated. There's a much simpler way of doing this for the purposes we want. And it looks like this. 0, 1, 2, 3. None, read, write, teach. And it turns out that's surprisingly useful. So, none, read, write, teach of C sharp. Right? I don't even know C sharp. I can look at someone else's C sharp and kind of figure it out, but I couldn't code it. I can code C sharp, I can teach someone C sharp. I wouldn't know influencing if I was staring at it. I can recognize good influencing skills, but I'm not very good at influencing. I can influence people, particularly outside of my direct area, so I can influence upwards or across. I can teach people influencing skills. So it's quite a nice universal model. And what we do, and it starts to look a lot like a spreadsheet, is we've got a spreadsheet. Okay, so let's take a look at, for a particular platform, <clears throat> I want to understand what are the, um, the particular skills and capabilities that would make you more or less interesting to me. Okay, so I might look at things like uh, architecture of this particular platform. So I've no idea even what it looks like, I kind of know what it looks like, I designed it, I can teach you what it looks like. Okay, zero, one, two, three. And what we ask is there's three numbers there. Um, I ask, uh, so the first number, two, Katie says, I think I can uh, build architecture for this platform. The two in brackets is if you ask my peers, they would tell you I'm a two as well. And the thing after the dotted line is where do you want to get to? And I'd love to be able to teach them. Okay? And then we look at this next one. She says she's a three with APIs, but her peers think she's a two. So she thinks she can teach this stuff. Her peers think she can write it, but she couldn't teach it. Why might that be? Maybe because she just hasn't had an opportunity yet. And what that's telling you is she'd like an opportunity. She'd like to do that. Or the other way around, if we look at the second row here, I've got uh, here, she says, uh, Chris here. Chris, in terms of integration, so I look at this platform integration, and he says, I think I can see how it integrates with other systems. If you ask my teammates, they'll tell you I know. I know I don't know. I'm the one-eyed man in the land of the blind. Right? No one else knows how this works. I have a bit of a clue how it works. Yeah. So when you ask them, they'll tell me. They'll tell you I know what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay? That just surfaced the gap. Yeah. And so you can use this to start matchmaking. I need to speed up. I'm about to run out of time. <clears throat> you can use this to start matchmaking. So people who want to learn things, people who want to teach things. And so now I can look at the team I've got for a particular project. So here's my business command. You can see the pool, the, the, the value chain now, the pool. So here's the thing I want to build, that many swags, pitch these systems, this is the team I've got on it, these are the skills and capabilities involved, and this is my spread. So I can say, well look, for skill number A, if this person leaves, I'm pretty light. Yeah? For this skill over here, if this person isn't available, if she's not available, I have got zero understanding of this. I don't even know how this thing works. I can start to look at the risks in my delivery. So, and again, it doesn't tell you how to solve it, it tells you you need to look at it. So now finally we get on to, um, <coughs> on to delivery mapping. So delivery mapping then says we've got these, this Venn diagram of business need, current skills, aspirational skills. So let's unpack this very quickly. In the middle is gold. It's stuff I can do that I want to learn how to do more and there's a business need. Great, go nuts, go do it. So what about this next one uh, here? So this is, I've got skills in this area, there's a business need, I'm not interested in growing that skill. I'm over it, yeah? Well, so there's an opportunity for me to teach. So I can now teach someone else that thing, which widens the pipe, it's Kaizen, right? It widens the pipe, uh, um, and, and it means that now someone else can do this thing. Likewise, the next one here is where I don't have a skill, but I want to learn that skill, and there's a business need, but that's an opportunity for me to go learn that thing, right? So that's kind of cool. So now I can learn that thing. And now the last one here, here be dragons. So this is where there's a business need, no one has the skill, and no one cares. <laughs> no one's interested in that. Yeah. Here be dragons, right? Again, I'm not telling you how to solve it, I'm telling you how to find it. Over here then on the right, we have <clears throat> a, an idea, so I've got current skills that I want to grow, but there's no business need. But this is now elective practice, this is where I go off on my own time and user groups and whatever else. And then the bottom one, similar sort of thing, an aspirational skill that I don't have, this is elective learning. So these two areas are areas where I can go and do stuff in my own time. As an organisation, you can choose to support that, sponsor it, have an opinion about it, or not. But it's there. Yeah? If you want happy people, help them grow. 
And this last one then, this last one is about opportunity. So this is stuff that I, can, that I know, I happen to know. I don't care that I know it, it's not on my aspirational place, and it's not a business thing at the moment. But, what if I could take that and maybe use that skill to solve the gap? And for instance, I could take a really gnarly SQL Server problem, and I need someone with deep transact SQL skills, and what if I could reimagine that as a Python problem? Right? And it may be that it's much easier to solve as a Python problem, and I made the problem go away. So that suggests then we've got three kinds of first class work, and this is where I part ways massively with most Agile people, or most Agile methodology people. Agile methods, as they are today, and as they have been for the last 20 years, track features. Okay? There's three different kinds of work. There's discovery, there's features, and there's closing. So all we care about is features. Velocity is features. Burn up and burn down is features. Okay? Uh, throughput is features. It's all features. Discovery is creating options. Discovery is figuring out different ways up the mountain. My goal is to get to the top of the mountain, not to cover lots of ground. Features measures how much ground you've covered, how much fuel you've got. It doesn't tell you how close to the goal you are. Okay? Kaizen is changing the system of work, is creating a better system of work, a more effective system of work. Kaizen in the small is your kind of you know, your, your, your continuous improvement type stuff. But if you pan back, Kaizen is really about making a more effective system of work. If Jeff teaches me a thing, spends a week teaching me a thing, we now have a different system of work. We have a system in which I know the thing as well. Now that takes me and Jeff out for a week. It's first class work, right? We're not available. And we track that as first class work. I want to see all three of these as maybe different coloured cards on your boards. Right? All of these are first class work. And if any of them, if you're not doing, if you're doing none of any of these, you're missing out. So if you're not doing any delivery, if you're not doing any features, that's your walking around money. Okay? That's your credibility. Oh, we're in discovery mode. I don't care. Ship something. Okay? This is about PR. But again, even if you've got a really good idea of where you're going, continue experimenting. Never be doing no discovery. And you should always have some level of Kaizen going on. Some level of, we're going to sharpen the axe. The, the wonderful, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, President of the United States. Um, no, not Nixon. <laughs> um, Barack Obama? No, no, much older. Founding father. Washington. Uh, oh, you'll know it. If I had six hours to, sh to knock down, to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four. Abraham Lincoln. I'd spend the first four sharpening the axe. Okay. If I had six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four sharpening the axe. It's still good advice. Because while you're sharpening the axe, you're not just sharpening the axe. You're thinking about it. You're walking around the tree. You're looking at the tree. And by the time you're ready to start chopping. You know exactly where you're going to start chopping, you know where the tree's going to fall, and you've already made enough noise that the squirrels aren't in the tree anymore. So you're not going to kill anything. Okay. So then, let's quickly sum this up. Initiative mapping. Where, what are we trying to move here? Feeds into demand mapping. Yeah. What are we going to try and build in order to achieve these, to move these dials? Katie and her skills, and everyone's skills. What, what can people do? What do they want to be able to do? Where do they want to be able to go? Uh, and the aspirational piece, put it all in a bag, shake it up, figure out what shape delivery should look like. And that, I suggest, is how you scale delivery. And at no point does it require any constraint of how people are currently structured, because we're moving the people to the work, which is what we should have been doing all along. And that's all I had. Thank you.